Good evening. This is Sean Bluchnot. It's again Monday evening from, as usual, from half past six till seven o'clock. We talk to you about issues of the faith on the program King of Glory. And uh, we have spoken to you the past the week about the Ark of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments. I want to pick up that again this week and as we further look together at the Ten Commandments. Now, <clears throat> first of all, I want to take your attention back to Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 to 4. The Bible says there, Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. A tabernacle was set up in its first room where the lamp stand, the table and the consecrated bread. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered ark of the covenant. This ark contained the golden jar of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. Now, also in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 17, here we find the Ten Commandments. It says, You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in, in the form of anything in heaven above or the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall have shall give no false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covert your neighbor's house, wife, his manservant or, or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, we said to you that the first four commandments regulate man's relationship to God, meaning that we must have a love for God. We must exhibit a love for God. And if you if you love God, you will have no other gods. If you love God, you will make no <clears throat> image uh, for yourself in the form of any idol. You, you will not misuse the name of the Lord and you will remember the Sabbath. And so the, the last six commandments, we said, regulate man's relationship to man. There must be a love for humanity. The Ten Commandments are also known, as we have said to you, as the Decalogue. The word Deca comes from two words. Deca is ten and, uh, and, 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 and Log is Logos, which is word. So we speak about the ten words of God. In rabbinical writings, the Decalogue is also expounded and expanded as the fountainhead from which all other laws would flow. So God's covenant with Israel was initiated with the Decalogue. When God made a covenant with Israel, he gave them law. And these laws he wrote on two tablets of stone. In the ancient uh, rabbis isolated about 613 separate commandments in the entire law of Moses. Now, these commandments were expanded and expounded out from the ten words of the Decalogue. The ten words of God are the principles upon which these 613 commandments are based. That's what we said to you the last time when we came together. Now, I want to take your attention back to Hebrews chapter 9 because we want to talk a little bit about Hebrews chapter 9 from verses 1 to 4. It says, Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. So there's, there, were, there were regulations that set up <clears throat> the methodology for their worship that was conveyed out from the covenant. A tabernacle was set up in its first room. I want you to see where the lamp stand, the table and the consecrated bread. There were three things there, the lamp stand, the table and the consecrated bread, the 12 loaves of the bread of his presence that were those that bread was placed upon the table. This was called the holy place. Behind the second curtain or the veil was a room called the most holy place, which had the golden altar of incense and the gold-covered ark of the covenant. This ark contained, and this is what I want you to see, this ark contained the golden jar of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, 
and the stone tablets of the covenant. Now I want to draw your attention to the Ark of the Covenant which contained three items. It contained the golden jar of manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the stone tablets of the law. Now for me, and we haven't got time to do this, the golden jar of manna speaks about the administration of grace. Aaron's rod that budded speaks about the theocratic principle in leadership and the stone tablets of the law speaks about the covenant that God wanted to cut in their hearts and in their minds. Now these three items, the golden jar of manna, the Aaron's rod that budded and the stone tablets of the law covenant, these three, these three items represent unto us three immutable, unchangeable, eternal principles which are central to our worship today. These must be erected within the heart to express pure and undefiled religion. Every activity of ours must be centered around these three immutable principles. Now the holy place is a, is a symbolic representation of Acts 2.42. The Bible says in Acts 2.42, they, they devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. Now for me, apostles' doctrine is really represented by the lampstand, fellowship by the table of the Lord, which brought a covenant community culture, and the breaking of the bread spoke about the consecrated bread, which really is grace. And then you have the prayers, which was seen in the golden altar of incense. We call the lampstand, the table, the consecrated bread, and the golden altar of incense. We call it, we, we, we look at that the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking bread, and prayers, we look at these as the four pillars that constitutes any apostolic company of people in the earth today. These four pillars that constitutes an apostolic house can be physically practiced. It precedes us entering beyond the veil into the deeper things of God. So these four pillars, which really is the lampstand, the table, the consecrated bread, and the golden altar of incense, which represented, first of all, the lampstand, the apostolic doctrine, the table, fellowship, consecrated bread, the breaking of bread, and the golden altar of incense prayer, these four pillars define the culture that should exist within any apostolic company of believers. Now, when we talk about apostolic company of believers, we're talking about that type of community that existed in the first century church when when the church was founded and formed by the Lord Jesus Christ. The church that we can see in bo the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 42, they continued steadfastly on the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking bread, prayers. The Bible also says that they were of one heart and one mind. From time to time, some of them would, so would sell their houses and lay the money at the apostles' feet for redistribution unto the needy amongst them so that there would be no needs within that com common community of believers. So these four pillars then define the culture that should exist within any apostolic company of believers. The veil that, that separates the first chamber or the holy place from the most holy place is symbolic of the flesh. So beyond the veil refers to a position beyond my flesh and your fleshly desires and carnal appetites. It is a dimension beyond the crucified flesh. Beyond the veil is to enter into the most holy place. It is the third dimension of grace which defines a governmental position within the Spirit of God. The most holy place contained the Ark of the Covenant and in it was the golden pot of manna, 
the rod of Aaron that budded, and the two tablets of the law. The four pillars of an apostolic community becomes the foundation and fundamental to our movement into the most holy place. These four fundamental principles are all administered through human vessels. You have apostolic doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer in the holy place. So this going beyond the veil position is practiced in the spirit. It is not something that is practiced within our soul. The holy place corresponds to the soul of man. But the most holy place corresponds to the spirit of man. So in order for us to move beyond the veil, there needs to be a crucifying of our flesh, our carnal desires and our appetites. We need to bring the cross into sharp focus in our lives, embrace the cross. This is what Jesus said, that you cannot be my disciple unless you follow me, lay down your life and take up your cross to follow him. So there needs to be a dying to self, like Paul would say in Galatians 2 verse 20, I am crucified with Christ and I no longer live. And the life I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. So in other words, there needs to be a crucifixion fiction we need to understand the objectivity of the of the justified position that Christ brought us into that he died once for all his death was an all encompassing death when he died i died in him 2000 years ago that's the object of our relationship through justification that comes through faith. But in our day to day, there needs to be an outworking of our salvation that the effects of the cross must be worked out in sanctification through our yieldedness to the Holy Spirit subjectively in our lives. So the most holy place then contained the Ark of the Covenant, and in it was the golden pot of manna, the rod of Aaron that budded, and the two stone tablets of the law. These four pillars uh, constitutes an apostolic community. It became the foundation fundamental to our movement into the most holy place. These four fundamental principles are administered through human vessels in the earth. So this going beyond the veil position is practiced in the spirit. It is a spiritual administration. It cannot be done in your soul. Prayer, the altar of incense, is fundamentally shifted from being mere ritual or religious practice to a deep spiritual engagement with our God. So in order for prayer to become governmental, you've got to, to be positionally shifted out from flesh, soulish activity by having your carnality torn and crucified. Governmental means prayer becomes kingdom activity, a means to, to serve the will and the purpose of God the King only. It is not self-infused, motivated or serving the selfish needs of our own ambitions and longings, but it is prayer under the total command of the Holy Spirit for the express purpose of kingdom advancement. So I want to draw your attention to the Ark of the Covenant that was positioned in the most holy place. Now the Ark of the Covenant typifies an eternal principle. There are three immutable principles locked up in the Ark of the Covenant, and they are represented by the golden pot of manna, the rod of Aaron that budded, and the two stone tablets of the law. Now the Ark represented a spiritual metaphor for the throne of God in Israel. The Ark speaks of the glory of God, the rule, the authority of God, the righteousness and the justice of God. The ark was evidence of God being in the midst of his redeemed people. The ark determined the accuracy of the people's journeying. It directed their movements in and through the wilderness. It was called the ark of testimony, the ark of witness, and the ark of the covenant. The ark brought testimony and witness to a people that God is with them. It was of the it was of the covenant inside the most holy place that gave purpose to 
the people's corporate gatherings. It was the Ark of the Covenant inside of the most holy place. Whenever Israel would camp, whenever they would journey, that Ark of the Covenant, while it was uh, within the most holy place. It gave purpose and meaning to the people's corporate gathering. Understand the word corporate gathering, not just individualistic approaches and the fragmented attempts at advancing the kingdom, but the corporate entity called the body of Christ, having in the midst of them the ark of God's presence, which speaks of the throne of God, the glory of God, the authority of God, the justice of God, the righteousness of God, the ark was that evidence of God being in the midst of his people. The ark determined the accuracy of the people's journeying. It directed their movements within the kingdom. So today the ark represents three immutable principles that must be erected within our spirits because the, the holy place represents our soul and the most holy place where the ark is represents our spirit dimension. Now in 1 Kings chapter 8 verses 6 and verses 9 there's an interesting comment that is being made by the writer. It says the priest then brought the Ark of the Lord's Covenant to its place in the inner sanctuary of the temple. Now I want you to see here that after Solomon constructed the temple, Solomon was going to bring the Ark of God's Covenant from David's tabernacle and was going to place it within the most holy place. And the scriptures open up in 1 Kings 8 uh, verses 6 and verse 9 by saying the priests then brought the ark of the of the Lord's covenant to its place in the inner sanctuary of the temple the most holy place and put it beneath the wings of the cherubim there now listen to this there was nothing in the ark except the two stone tablets that Moses had placed in it at Mount Horeb where the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites after after they came out of Egypt. I want you to see the following, that the golden pot of manna and the rod of Aaron that budded were removed out from the ark and the only thing that, were, that was within the ark of the covenant was the two stone tablets of the law that remained within the ark. So when the ark came to its final resting place in Solomon's temple, they removed the golden pot of manna they removed the, 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 the rod of Aaron that budded and left only the two stone tablets of the law that remained inside of the Ark of the Covenant. Why is this significant for us today? Because secular humanists today say that there, there, there are no absolutes in the earth and in the world today, meaning that there is no foundation that can set the morality and the norms and the ethics of human society, that any everything in human society is relative, that any everything in human society is relative to human experience. But we as believers, we as Christians, we believe in the unshakable foundation of God's word. We believe in the unshakable foundation that is fundamental to our belief system that there is a God out from whom flows all the moral, ethical character principles whereby man ought to operate in the earth. And so God made an emphatic statement that day when the, when the ark, the what the, that, what, that when God left only within the ark the two tablets of the law he was making a statement that there are still in this world there are still immutable principles that is locked up in the, the absolute nature of God that God is central to to the universe, not man. Now, secular humanists believe that through the humanistic philosophies that are out there, that man is central to his own universe. But I have a strong disbelief in that because God is central to his creative works. God is in the midst of the earth. And the, the Bible clearly says that the earth is God's footstool and the, and the heavens is his throne. So 
The heavens is God's throne, but the earth is God's footstool. The scripture also says that the earth is the Lord's and all of them that dwelleth therein. So God is central to human life. Out from God comes forth life. God doesn't need anyone to give him life because he is the self-existent one. Out from him flows the issues pertaining to life. So God is the only absolute in the physical universe universe and so that nullifies negate what the new ages are telling us they saying that man is central and that in everything is God there is a pantheistic viewpoint of the scriptures which doesn't exist in God's mind because there is not a lot of gods there's only one God it's a triunity father son and spirit having one corporate name Lord Jesus Christ and we know as Christians that's the God that we believe that's the God that we dictate it's a God of absolutes now God set for us immutable eternal unchanging principles in the Decalogue in the Ten Commandments these principles cannot be erased out of the earth because they define the very nature the very being the very purpose of our God and so only the Ten Commandments are left within the Ark of the Covenant meaning if we talk about the Ark of the Covenant it was positioned in the most holy place and I have said to you that the holy place speaks to us about our our soul dimension, where our thoughts, intellect, reasoning, where our longings are. But beyond the veil of our own flesh, when we are busy taking upon us the crucified life, now God ushers us into the most holy place of our own spirits. And in that place is the ark of God set up. And within the ark must only remain in our hearts, must only remain an observance of the Ten Commandments of God that we are observe the Decalogue, that we observe our love for God, Godward first, and out of that flows a second law that is like unto the first, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So the ultimate in God's law is that it's swallowed up in the law of love. The law of love is twofold. It's Godward. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. And the second is like unto the first, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The first four laws of the Decalogue of the Ten Commandments is our man's response to a loving God and we relating to God based on these four commandments. But the last six regulates our relationship to humankind, to mankind. But you cannot relate to man effectively until you relate first in a loving relationship with God the Father. Father. Humanism is man's attempt to love man without having the fundamental foundation of loving God first. When we do not love God and we only love man, that is equal to humanistic love. It is not, it is not the, the, the agape love. It is the phileo love. It is that love just of brotherly kindness. But it doesn't flow out from the fundamental foundation of humans loving God first first. So why would God place such tremendous importance on the law stone tablets to make it the only imperative that drives the heart's desire? The Ten Commandments must be interpreted initially within the context of the Sinai Covenant. It was considered to be the constitution of the state information during the time of Moses and Joshua. God was Israel's king who established their law. He governed them via the Decalogue and set them on a course towards statehood and their liberation from slavery from the bondage of Pharaoh. The Decalogue regulated their moral, civil, eth and ethical conduct towards God and their fellow men. So the Decalogue brought slaves who were for 450 years without law into divine 
order. Every time God wants to install the principles of divine government, God must give the people law. Remember that Peter says that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. We are a nation, a holy nation, and every nation must have a constitution. The constitution of the holy nation, which is the church of Jesus Christ, is still found within the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments. Jesus comes years later and he said, I did not come to abolish your law, neither your prophets but I have come to fulfill them. So Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law. He even goes further and he says, uh, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my law shall never pass away. So the law of God is immutable. The law of God is unchangeable. The law of God cannot be ripped asunder and apart as people are saying today. Humanists are saying that these laws do not exist because we are living in a physical reality. We're living by our experience and there is no God. But the Bible says only a fool says in his heart that there is no God. So the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments are very central to our belief system because that brings the ethical codes, the moral codes, the norms by which society is to operate by. And so without this laws, without the Ten Commandments, mankind will be left to himself, yes, and will have a humanistic morality, will have a, 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 a setting laws and morals by the standards of what we call democracy, where men, the majority starts to rule and say, we have made a choice that there is no such a thing as only one man for one woman. So we are, we are going up against the sanctity of marriage, and so we can install a new law by saying, saying a man can love a man and get married. A woman can love a woman and get married. Now, I want to say to you that there are absolutes in God. And so we need to come back to the absolute foundation called the living Christ. And he has given us the Decalogue. And we cannot get away from the law of God. With that child of God for tonight, we will leave you here and pick this up next week. God bless you.